to everyone. And I would like to welcome you to Becoming Trauma-Informed in Adult Education. My name is Jay, and I'm an adult educator and social worker who is currently a board member of WeLearn, which is co-sponsoring this event with World Ed. And WeLearn has been around for about 20 years and has been committed since its beginning to promoting women's literacy as a tool for both empowerment and equity. Our signature project is an annual publication called Women's Perspectives, which since 2006 has published original writing and artwork from adult learners covering a range of themes. Our most recent issue, We Are Still Here, celebrates the resilience and resourcefulness of women during a global pandemic. By guiding and supporting students, as well as teachers, Women's Perspectives has been a place where many adult learners have been able to publish their ideas and their creative works for the first time. More recently, with the support of our advisory committee, we've been able to facilitate some webinars on women and COVID-19 and critical race theory in adult education. And I wanna give a shout out to the advisory committee, uh, Geraldine Becker, who's a board member who serves as committee co-chair, Jessica ramos Bahena, a former student, Heidi Bacon, Janice Hertig, Eric Jacobson, Diane Ramdahal, and Priyanka Sharma. Since they were very critical thought partners as we reflected on what we were hearing from adult educators and students in these webinars. While people were surviving and innovating, we were also hearing about real struggles, with educators in particular noting how trauma responses like anxiety and fear were impacting both students and themselves. And everyone was seeking community and guidance on how to teach and learn beside this trauma and take care of themselves as well. So Priyanka, who was the VP of World Ed uh, US, was especially helpful in nurturing the connection between we learn and Danny and Stacy, the experts speaking today. And we're really excited about being able to make this vision a reality. So thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to go over some basic Zoom control instructions for you. You can find the uh, control panel at the bottom of your screen. You might need to hover your mouse down there to make it pop up. And please be sure that when you use the chat, select everyone from the drop down menu so that everyone can see your comment unless you're intending to speak to one person directly. If you have some sort of tech issue and I don't see your comment in the chat, please use the hand raise feature, which can also be found on the control panel, and that will get my attention. We ask everyone to stay muted for the time being, so please make sure that the uh, mute icon is selected with the uh, red cross going through it so that you are muted unless you are actively speaking. And if there are any other issues, please contact me at the email address you see in the fourth box. One other instruction is that uh, we have the annotation feature, which can be found on the control panel in the bottom of your screen. And these are some instructions for that if you want to briefly review those. And if you need closed captions, you can find that on the control panel as well. It should be the button marked CC and those are enabled, so they should be ready for you to use. Thank you. Hi everyone. So um, I'm going to just um, briefly introduce our co-presenters. Uh, just a reminder, please introduce yourself in the chat so we can see um, who's here. Presenting today is Danny Scherer, who is a curriculum and professional development specialist at World Education and has worked in the field of adult education for over 13 years. We also have Stacy Seward, an experienced clinician with expertise in trauma's effect on the brain, who is also a certified mediator and DEI professional. And she and Danny have both collaborated in the past. And, um, you know, myself, as well as Ebony, who's helping with the tech. And I'd also just like to mention briefly um, the help of advisory committee members, Edith Ganadas and Heidi Bacon, who will be monitoring the chat today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay and Ebony. 
for welcoming us and orienting us to this session. Two more notes I'd just like to share. We will um, be sending the recording as well as the PowerPoint and all materials we reference in a follow-up email. So just be assured that you are gonna be getting that. If you would like the PowerPoint slides as we go through them, um, please send me a private chat and I can send you the link if you'd like to access them as we're going through, but know that you will get them afterwards. So as we move into this space, I want to take a moment to acknowledge recent events that have been heavy, that has been traumatizing, that has been weighing on our collective and societal experience recently. And I also at the same time want to acknowledge any personal issues that you are bringing into this space, anything that's weighing heavy today on your heart or your mind. I wanna give you a moment to add anything into the chat so that we as a collective can share in what you're experiencing, knowing that you're not alone. If you wanna say privately, you can send it to one of us, one of the facilitators, and we'll put it into the chat for you. But for others, let's just take one minute to acknowledge and share any of these recent events, personal issues into the chat. Thank you, Leah. Melinda, thank you. There is so much, Kirsten, absolutely. I wanna thank each person for sharing. Please continue to add. It's very powerful to see these pouring in. The reason we do this is because a trauma-informed practice and a healing-centered practice is not to always go about business as usual. We don't always want to pretend that learners and colleagues are coming into an educational space without the weight of these issues, as well as those personal issues, impacting their ability to engage and learn. So we do this as a way to model a practice that is trauma-informed and healing-centered. And while we don't have a lot of time in this session to process what you've put into the chat, you can, if you are in a class that is um, longer, or you've worked with a group of students, do a practice like I know one teacher has students write out these issues on um, paper towel in colored markers and then puts them in a bowl of water and swirls them around and those become simply colors in the water as a way to process and help students to prepare to be in the learning space. We wanted to start off by modeling this activity, and I want to thank you for being shared, for sharing and being vulnerable. We're going to move on to the next slide, which is what we hope you walk away from this session with. So we have an hour and a half together. It's not a lot of time, and yet Stacy and I put our heads together to think about what is going to be most impactful for you in this time and what feels most salient and relevant. And so what we do want to do is have you walk away being able to articulate the importance of having a trauma lens and a healing-centered approach in adult education, and also give you some practices that feel useful right away for your work. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about some of the more um, physiological, um, medical diagnoses of what happens 
in the brain um, and what happens and how that impacts learning. We recognize that some of you have a background or you know a little bit about this. What we have done instead is put together a curated resource list that you can explore in a self-directed way to deepen your understanding of that. Instead, we wanna really move into the practices that are going to create a healing-centered space. I wanna say that regardless of your role in adult education, whether you are a student, a teacher, a director, data entry, administrator, curriculum developer, advisor, you are going to be able to fully participate in the session and get something from it. If you are um, like me and have taught in adult education, you might have had the experience that I have, which is training in how to teach and what to teach, but not necessarily some of these factors, societal factors, trauma, identity, that impact our learners and their ability to learn and engage. But I did not learn about this in any of my trainings. And therefore, we want to thank We Learn for offering this training um, for all of you today. So we'll move into our agenda on the next slide. We've already started the session, but I do just wanna give you a little heads up about what's coming. So we're gonna do some norms as another trauma-informed practice to model. We're gonna do a grounding exercise. And as a result of that, we're gonna hear about what you are already doing in your work, wherever you work, that is trauma-informed. Stacey's then gonna guide us through um, a baseline understanding of trauma and also talk about the shift from trauma-informed to healing-centered. And then she's going to give us some practices that we can use right away. Now we do have one breakout room in this session and we um, sent an email because we wanted you to feel prepared and warned about that. Um, and that occurs um, towards the end of the session. And if possible, we would like you to have your camera and audio on. If not, please know that you can turn your camera off at any point um, throughout this session, um, especially if you're concerned about bandwidth. We'll come back all together at the end um, for some share out and make sure you know the resources that are available to you. Um, the most important thing about this slide I wanted to share is that we are modeling trauma-informed practices as we go. So these aren't just for your use with students. These are for you right now, today, too, to benefit from and to receive the care of these practices. So we'll actually move into our, um, our second modeling, which is on the next slide, and that is our norms, our session norms. So what you see in front of you is some session norms that we pulled from other places. And what we would like you to do now is tell us which ones resonate with you. And the way you're going to do this is the annotation tools that Ebony described. So if you go to the top of your screen, um, you can click on view options. It says you are viewing Ebony's screen. Go to view options. And then on the little drop down, you'll see annotate. If you click on annotate, a little toolbar will, will open up and you're only gonna use the stamps here. So some people are already very familiar with this tool, so you totally get it. You're gonna use the stamps and you can use a heart, a star or a check mark to say which ones of these norms you want us to engage in in this session that feel important to you. If you have a question about one of them, you can put a question mark. And if there's norms that you would like to practice here, but you don't see, please put those in the chat and we'll include those as well. This is cool. And if you're having trouble, um, with the tools, make sure you're on stamp instead of text or arrow. Now, as a reminder, when you're done annotating, you're gonna to wanna to click that little red X, that little um, circle X, and that will make sure your cursor goes back to a normal cursor and is no longer continuing to put hearts everywhere all over your screen. So you're gonna to wanna to do that or else you're gonna keep making hearts and stars everywhere. 
So I'm seeing a lot around use asset based and affirming language. I see a lot around consider this the beginning and not the end. That's really imp important for our work. I see a lot around taking care of yourself, being curious, challenging ideas and not people. Step up, step back, have some questions. This means in my best understanding that if you are someone who normally takes up a lot of space, like in a breakout room, um, make sure you're equally stepping back to give room for others. If you're someone who's normally quiet, maybe use this as an opportunity to step up a little bit. So that's what step up, step back means to me. Okay, so when you're done stamping, click out of your toolbar by clicking that little X and Rachel's also helping us navigate our tools in the chat if you're having some um, problems with your mouse. And I'm going to save this drawing, but then I'm also going to clear all drawings so that it doesn't carry over into our next spot. Now, the most important thing I think about these norms, and I wanna tell you how much I've learned from my collaboration with Stacy. It's been very, very important to learn from Stacy. And one thing that is important about setting norms is that if you have more time, this is not normally something that the teacher or the leader presents to the class in the way that I did here. We simply did this in a matter of time because of time. Ideally, this is co-created so that everyone is equally a co-architect of creating this space together. So you can use this kind of model in your work and yet remember that norms can come from the students themselves and you can give them some examples as I've done here, but you can also engage in that collaborative process. Okay, cleared all drawings, I'm Xing out of here so I don't keep stamping. And we'll go on to the next slide. I'm seeing um, some appreciation and love for step up, step back. And then Sabine says, take space and make space is another way to say step up and step back. I really like that, Sabine, thank you. If there's any norms missing or agreements, please add those to the chat. Okay. So we're moving into our third modeling activity here. And this is a grounding exercise. So what we will do here is spend two minutes. The first minute, simply grounding. The second, I'll ask you these two questions and you'll, and you'll visualize them. Um, and when we come back together, and by that I mean open our eyes again, um, I'll ask you to share some of the responses to these questions. But for now, don't worry about the question. Don't worry about what's on your screen. We'll instead move into a simple grounding exercise. To start off, you can have your eyes open or closed as you would like. You can turn your camera on or off as you would like for this next minute. So take a minute just to feel yourself in your seat. If your legs are uncrossed, maybe you want to, if your legs are crossed, maybe you want to uncross them. To feel alignment in your spine and to feel your bones kind of settling around that alignment. Once you feel your spine in alignment, just feel your flesh and your muscles settling around your bones. Notice if you have any areas of tension in your body and just notice it. Maybe send some relaxation into that part of your body. Now feel the clothing and the air temperature on your skin and just become attuned.
Now that you're grounded, I'm gonna ask this question and I want you to just visualize the answer. What do you do to make other people, this could be students, this could be colleagues or family members, feel care and belonging? What are some things you do to make other people feel care and belonging? You can think about a classroom space or a workspace or a home. Picture the body language, the words you choose to say, maybe the routines you engage in, things you point out. What do you do to make other people feel a sense of care and belonging? So jot down a few mental notes as you visualize that. And then once you have some of those mental notes, come back into the Zoom space. Maybe that means opening your eyes again. Maybe that means turning your video back on. And now navigate over to the chat. And I want you to open the link that I just put into chat, which is a Menti link, Mentimeter link. And it's gonna ask you to write three words or phrases that come to you in response to that question that I asked. What do you do to make other people feel sense of care and belonging, maybe to feel safety, but we want to make the point. And what I'm learning from Stacy is that you can't always make people feel safe, especially when we're talking about students, but you can make them feel cared for and belonging. So open that Menti link and it can, it gives you the option to enter three words or phrases and keep these short. Um, so just one word is best. And you can do a, a short phrase with two words if you would like. And I'm starting to see our word cloud generate here. So you might not be able to see it yet. You'll see it in a second when we share it. So it's, just keep entering your responses. And then Ebony, I think we're ready to show some of the results here. So if you go to the next slide. and click on the review word cloud, I think we'll see some things that came up here. Wow. All right, I think that's the biggest we'll get. It's a little bit small, but we can deal. Is there any way to make that bigger, I'm wondering? I just tried and I'm not able to. So unfortunately. Okay. No. okay. All right. Um, what I'll remind people is that you can kind of move your screen to um, video participants um, space bar over to make your own screen bigger. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and then you can see these maybe a little bit better. And it looks like Ebony is working on sharing them. There we go, 100%. We will definitely share this and we're gonna import it into the slides so that when we share out the slides with you, you can see all of these. Now I wanna just reflect and I wanna ask Stacy, do you have any reflections for what you see here from what people said they do to make other people feel a sense of care and belonging? Any reflections on what we see? Yeah, I mean, there are some common themes here that we will be talking about as we go into healing-centered practices. And so um, it, it looks like that a lot of this is kind of foretelling in terms of some of the practices. And it, it seems like some of you are already using some of those practices to encourage um, healing-centered spaces um, in, in, your learning, um, in your learning spaces. So this... Um, 
I, I think it's, you know, I, I'm actually surprised because especially when we have phrases, it's really hard to get phrases to, to, ma to like match up, but I'm intrigued by the eye, eye contact piece, right? Because lots of people had to have said eye contact. Um, and so that is very important just in terms of having your students um, or, the, or even your colleagues um, acknowledge that you are paying attention and being present. So lots of lots of great phrases and words here. Yeah, and then Leah says, "I see both acknowledge and acknowledgement, and um, listen is very big at the middle. Um, make food, I like that. Active listening, love, take time, listen with empathy, attention." Thank you so much. We will um, save this and I think we'll go back to our PowerPoint. Yeah, I also wanna acknowledge what's in the chat for sure um, for folks who um, have differing learning needs and um, different abilities that for sure we wouldn't wanna have that be a focus. I was just pointing out that lots of people had put that up there. And I think you're right, culturally, not every culture acknowledges that as a way of paying attention, but I just found it telling that many folks um, lifted that up. But thank you thank for those you. in the thank chat who are, who are already kind of getting into what some of what we'll get into in terms of limitations of some of our kind of dominant culture, dominant culture thinking. So thank you for that. Thank you, great conversation in the chat. So we'll go on to the next slide. And these are a few foundational core understandings and assumptions that we would like to share with you in this session. And um, the first one at the top is number one for a reason, and that is that we're not just talking about our students when we talk about the need for trauma-informed and healing-centered work in adult education. This impacts each and every single one of us, and we're all in need of the same kind of support. Number two for understanding here is that social identity and our lived experience impacts our exposure to trauma. And um, anyone, for example, who's worked with English language learners and specifically refugees knows the unique trauma many refugees have been exposed to that impacts their learning experience. Number three, um, Stacy said many times this could be a whole session in and of itself, which is absolutely true. We want to have the understanding that trauma does impact the brain and learning. And oftentimes um, in adult education and in K-12, there's a lot of misdiagnosis around behavior, um, around disengagement that really does come back to the effect that trauma has on the brain and learning. And yet it's followed quickly up by number four, which is that we're taking a strength-based resilience approach. So what that means is that the practices we are talking about today are all aimed to bring the mind and the body back on board for optimal health and learning um, by focusing on students' strengths, on our colleagues' strengths. Number five is that healing spaces are participatory and co-created. So that means like we did with the norms, well, like we didn't do with the norms, those are really ideally um, based around ideas of collaboration, um, also this idea of student leadership, so that the norms and the practices are co-created by students, teachers, administrators, staff. Number six, you can't command a healing space. Um, that means you can't say this is now a healing space and this is now a safe space. That's not up to us to be able to do. Um, I want to credit Stacey again with teaching me about this and the importance of that. Um, there's a limit to what we can do, and that ties into number seven, which is know your limits. You um, are not necessarily, you're not a clinical mental health provider. You um, can't change things drastically. What we're talking about today are things you can do. But the last point I'll make is that this is a program-based approach that involves a cultural shift. We can't do this alone. And yet we hope what we give you today gives you some ideas of what you can do. 
So um, right before I turn it over to Stacy, we'll just go to the next slide. I'll leave you with this quote, which is from Bell Hooks. Rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. That's why we're all here today doing this together as opposed to just doing our own work because we know that in order to heal from all of the things that you mentioned at the beginning of this session in the acknowledgement section, we need to come together in spaces like this. And I'll turn it over to you, Stacy. Thank you, Danny. Um, you know, I, I just feel like I want to pause for a second um, as I was reading some of the things that were weighing on our minds in, in the chat, I think it's really important for us um, as we, as educators in this space, are dealing with some of these geopolitical, geonational events, that our students are also impacted by these events. And so as we shift into our next screen, I want to be able to talk a little bit about the social determinants of trauma. And I think often um, when we think about, you know, a lot of these terms, uh, particularly since the pandemic have literally in some ways lost their meaning and impact. They've become, um, you know, these buzzwords. And so folks, I think sometimes are coming from different spaces when they use terms like social determinants of health or social determinants of trauma. And so I wanted to spend some time here a little bit level setting and communicating about what we're talking about when we use the term social determinants of trauma. And so it's really important for us to know that social inequities are multidimensional. Um, we can't put social inequities in a box and say it's this thing or this thing, right? And not only are they multidimensional, they are intersectional and they compound. And so when we are using or lifting up the term social determinants of trauma, we're talking about um, economic inequity, right? And so challenges with obtaining economic equity, which is wealth, income, property. Um, we're talking about the types of cultural capital. And I think in the chat, um, Michelle Walter and Lee um, did a great job talking about how dominant culture norms sometimes can take over a space, right? And so when we're talking about things like eye contact, for some folks that can be, yes, that makes sense that we're acknowledging um, folks in the room. And it does for some people, but it's also important to note that for folks who, um, have different worldviews, different culture, um, not having a grasp of not understanding, um, not being participatory in some of the American cultural norms can actually um, impact their cultural capital, right? Um, and then we have social capital, right? Uh, as a social inequity, right? Where folks do not necessarily have access to social networks, um, to clubs, to, um, you know, we often talk of the golf course chats, right? Being able to do business on the golf course, right? Those are forms of social capital that oftentimes our students don't have access to. Um, and so these vital inequities um, are also connected to our life in general, right? So we're talking about life, health, and death. They are expressed indicators such as life expectancy, birth, or infant mortality rates, which are used to qualify or, or quantify comparisons between populations. This type of inequity refers to human beings as living organisms who experience a differentiated set of vulnerabilities in terms of their health and physical and mental well-being, and in term, in turn, depend on a set of socially produced conditions um, and organizational responses, such as reliance or dependence on public health services, among other things. And so these resource inequities um, manifest themselves in an, in, an unequitable and inequitable distribution of resources. And more specifically, they include dimensions such as 
income um, inequality, wealth, education and schooling, professional qualifications, um, um, and hierarchical positions um, that are needed to survive in social networks in order to get social capital. And that was a very long way of me saying that social inequities are very, very complicated. As we move on to kind of institutional inequities, right? And that is the way that institutions incorporate, uh, pull themselves together and have historical practices, um, social practices, such as in places like academic institutions or in banks or in corporations or nonprofit organizations or in government or even in educational organizations, right? That institutional inequity can play out um, and cause trauma for folks who don't have access to the same resources. And then finally, we have some of these living conditions um, and traumas that are caused, right, by things like living in food deserts, um, environmental hazards such as lack of clean water, indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, um, chronic exposure to community um, internal or external violence, uh, the impact of over policing, um, and lead and noise pollution, right? So those would all be indicative of the social determinants of trauma associated with living conditional. And then we have um, edu educational inequities related to funding disparities, resource disparities, um, the mental health and behavioral risks that are associated with such disparities. And, and finally, you know, what we have are, is probably the most uh, pressing um, issue, which is the impact of all of these social determinants of trauma um, on our students who don't have any of these, right? Or who have compound traumas, right? Who are experiencing social and institutional inequity, who do have challenges with their living conditions, who do experience educational inequities um, and who are um, vulnerable to mental and behavioral health and physical health risks as a result of social policy. Um, and so next slide, please. So as we look at public policy, right? And I wanna pause for a minute to talk about um, public policy as it relates to the social determinants of trauma. Uh, despite one's beliefs, our broader public policy can cause trauma and harm to all in our learning community. Polarizing public policy issues such as abortion, anti-LGBTQ plus sentiments, um, the, the, the quote unquote talk around border security or border policy, uh, CRT and critical race theory um, are all impacting our learning and impacting um, communities and add to trauma. Additionally, overt and chronic injustice um, in our learning commun uh, communities um, and the way in which all of these injustices are promoted on all forms of media can also contribute to injury for impacted persons. The shift toward equity requires acknowledgement and validation of the intersection of social and institutional determinants of trauma. And so integrating awareness of these social determinants into the curriculum is key to moving the needle forward on student healing and engagement. And so while we talk about communities of color being impacted by inequity um, and policy and practices, much of that is intentional. Much of that is, is set up that way and purposeful, right? So the system, you know, I, I was listening to some of the testimony um, on gun violence yesterday. And there was a mom of a, the young, uh, a young man in Texas who is still recovering at home. And she very eloquently said, you know, we keep saying to ourselves as these incidents happen over and over again, that, you know, this is not who we are. And this mom unapologi unapologetically said, no, in fact, this is who we are. And yes, the systems are set up to be this way. Um, so when we're talking about intentionality, 
Uh, we are talking about a system that really has not been designed um, to be favorable for or help in particular those who are othered. Um, however, what was once aimed to limit um, the few is now destroying the many. And so as witnessed by you know, the ongoing opioid crisis, that has decimated both rural and urban communities, um, discriminatory and inequitable access to supports um, are now shared by many Americans, right? And many folks who don't identify as American um, in this country, regardless of race or geography. And in fact, estimates suggest that up to 25% of children in the nation's rural communities live in extreme poverty, driven by inadequate funding for local education systems and the lack of upward mobility. And so, um, in fact, the majority of American children living in poverty are actually white. There were 4.2 million. And this is uh, data pulled from um, Eric B, uh, Educational Research uh, Database. And so what we're seeing here is that inequities, social inequities and the social determinants of trauma impact all of us, right? And when you compound existing social inequities with things like racism, with things like healthcare inequities, with other types of trauma, we really find ourselves in a position where it's difficult for us to think about, well, where do we go from here? And again, I was reminded of this. I felt it to my core as I was reading about what was weighing on folks' minds, right? So where do, where do we start, right? So strong support for community resources um, is key um, for what we're doing, what we need to do for um, getting folks connected to resilience, getting people to resilience, right? And building a community uh, resilience rests with the ability to influence the spaces and communities where children live, adults live, where families live, play, and grow. It also means engaging with adult learners and the broader community by showing up as allies, walking in partnership and solidarity with impacted persons. Um, next slide, please. And so I wanna talk briefly about the difference between post-traumatic stress, which is um, you know, violent and life-threatening events where symptoms tend to include flashback, panic attacks, nightmares, and depression. Um, we generally see post-traumatic stress in folks like uh, combat veteran survivors, uh, folks who have experienced trauma actually arriving in the continental U.S., folks who have experienced, um, you, you see this in folks who have experienced car crashes um, or other sorts of um, violent events that tend to be short-term, although post-traumatic stress can happen for long-term events as well, right? But then we have continuous and persistent traumatic stress, right? And that is long-term. And so with, studio, with students that can show up as long-term bullying or ongoing family trauma, constant exposure to violence, poverty, police brutality, or school, workplace, community inequity, um, housing, and or food insecurity, a fear of any type of harm, including uh, deportation, um, all kinds of exploitation, and then constant exposure to the isms and othering. Um, and being and living in an environment that is anti-CRT, anti-LGBTQ+, anti just about woman, woman anti just about everything, right? Um, those are forms of continuous and persistent tra uh, traumatic stress. And so when you couple that with individuals who are also experiencing post-traumatic stress, and then you combine that with the social determinants of trauma, it begins to, to paint a picture of how incredibly challenging all of these issues are and what our uh, learning community brings to the table. Uh, next slide, please. I wanna talk briefly about some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, um, but it includes things like high anxiety, panic, exaggerated reflexes and resources and, and um, reactions. Um, it can often include overreactions, right? So you can see this 
um, over-exaggerated response to something that is seemingly um, a disruption, but a minor disruption. Um, it, restlessness, um, just the need for folks in the learning community to always be going, feeling like that um, they're not getting things done, um, maybe even creating some sort of drama to be able to be focused on what is next. Um, this manifests in, in, in seeing um, physical symptoms such as digestive problems, um, stomach pain, head pain. So, so folks in the learning community who are you know, continuously talking about having all types of what we call psychosomatic pain um, can be indicative of traumatic stress, uh, stress uh, sleeplessness, trouble sleeping, um, rage, uh, particularly rage that seems disproportionate to the actual um, event that triggered the rage, um, depression, exhaustion, folks, uh, you know, falling asleep often, uh, disconnection, just feeling uh, a sense of like isolation, uh, difficulty or inability to express emotions, and not only a difficulty to express emotions, but the inability to uh, express them um, in a manner that seems uh, productive. Um, and then high rates of absenteeism or tardiness is what we might see in our learning community. Next slide, please. Um, and then how it can manifest in a, an adult education classroom is shifts between hypoarousal and hypoarousal. And, and what that really means, and we talked about this on the previous slide, is that you know there could be a particular event or a topic that comes up in the, in, in the learning space where a student um, is overreacting um, to that particular uh, topic or maybe even seemingly underreacting. And of course, this is all relative. Um, it can manifest in, in terms of, you know, a lack of focus where there previously appeared to be focus, um, outbursts, crying, laughing, uh, laughing and anger, um, emotionalists or, or over-emotional, um, volatility from day to day or sometimes moment to moment, um, and vacill like vacillation in between um, you know, one day somebody comes in really, really excited and personable, the next day very depressed, and the next day comes in very high energy again. Um, memory challenges where students, you know, particularly if you know folks in the learning com community well, and all of a sudden a student is having difficulty retaining information where before they weren't, um, and, and there are similar uh, comparisons to some of those recall challenges where for whatever reason, um, folks in the learning community are having difficulty retaining um, information. And then there were other examples that we can think of that I'm hoping that in your breakout groups, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to talk about. Um, and I, I'm trying to check out um, some of what's happening um, in, in the chat just around, somebody said somebody abruptly leaving the room without saying anything. Um, that can certainly be um, a manifestation. Um, that could be that person's way of exhibiting emotional regulation to remove themselves, um, knowing that they might um, actually act out, or it could just be that they are on information overload and don't know how to handle the in information um, that's being challenging. Challenge. And somebody said leaving a Zoom class um, for no reason, um, avoid avoidance and withdrawal. Absolutely, those are all examples of how. Uh, trauma can manifest in the adult education classroom. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna pause for a minute. I'm actually trying to keep up with the chat here to see if there were any um, questions um, that folks have um, about all of those uh, kind of manifestations and what we saw. Um, Stacey, so, Stacey, there yeah. was one other comment on chat. It was about okay. discomfort or overwhelm with choices and lack of structure. Yes, um, and we're, we're gonna talk about how important structure is in terms of creating a healing centered space. But yes, um, seemingly choices that should um, be relatively, I, I guess in our own kind of personal judgment, you know, binary, binary choices can be very overwhelming for folks and kind of not only overwhelming, but kind of keep them 
um, we call this initiation, like keep them from initiating so that they are not moving forward with the rest of the tasks that are at hand. So for sure, um, we see that the, the, the discomfort um, around choices. And then, yeah, and, and trust can and sometimes will take a long time um, based on or depending on the level of trauma um, that somebody's experiencing. Yeah. Yep. It's again the physical illnesses and in response to trauma. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to talk about, and we really want to make this shift from being trauma informed, which I think is helpful um, and useful for anybody in the learning community. But we want to make sure that we're moving from trauma informed approaches and actually moving toward um, and embracing healing centered approaches. Um, and so here are some, I, I'm going to, you know, read very quickly some of the differences, right, between a trauma informed approach and a healing centered approach. Um, and so oftentimes in trauma-informed um, spaces, we're accustomed to, to really asking and inquiring about what happened to the individual instead of saying, you know, where, what are those individual's assets, right? What, what's going um, right? What is going well with that individual? And how do we leverage that individual's strengths? Um, in trauma-informed work, it focuses on the harm and injury to the individual, which I, I think is important in terms of understanding. Um, but however, in, in shifting into a healing centered um, practice, we wanna focus on the ongoing and holistic healing of individuals. Um, we wanna build those interpersonal relationships. Um, as Lee said, we wanna talk about building trust um, and we want to be able to address um, some of the challenges within um, relationships and institutions. Um, and we want to challenge those institutions um, to also become healing-centered and healing-focused. Um, Trauma-informed work uses um, clinical and individual approaches. And it's, you know, why Danny said earlier, it's really important that we are not um, changing um, learning-centered spaces into clinical mental health uh, spaces, rather understanding where our limits are and really not trying to treat folks, but consider this, the environment um, in the context of trauma. So we're acknowledging what the environment looks like in that, in the contextually as it relates to trauma, but we're not necessarily trying to treat the trauma. Um, and trauma-informed work focuses on treating clients rather than supporting um, folks in building um, and strengthening their own healing, um, being the architects of their own healing and well-being, right? So we're there as a support rather, uh, rather than a practitioner um, in this healing-centered space. Um, sorry. Uh, there is a lot of, sorry, I'm, I'm reading Sarah's, uh, there is a lot of connection to the um, asset-based and strength-based approach. Um, I think there are some steps that are required to make sure that in addition to the approach, the environment is suitably um, arranged so that students can optimally feel like that it's a healing-centered space. But yes, there are definitely connections there. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk about the the four pillars um, of how we, um, to Sarah's point, use these asset based strategies to create a healing centered space, right? And so, I, the, one of the first steps in doing that um, is realizing and having a basic understanding of not only trauma but healing. Um, we understand how it affects families and groups and and the learning community. But do we talk about in our healing spaces, um, the coping strategies, right? Um, and how are we addressing um, those coping strategies in our learning spaces? Um, how are we allowing students the space to heal um, through their learning experience? 
um, how are we recognizing um, the signs of trauma and how are we facilitating that space that advocates and promotes healing? Um, and so they are specific based on you know, their age. Um, are, how are we partnering with um, other folks in the learning community um, to make sure that if we're in need of ass uh, assessment or assistance that we are um, accessing those resources? Um, how are we responding? Um, how are we responding to um, how our students are lifting up their needs? Um, are we making sure that our entire learning community um, is educated about the needs of our students? Are we making sure that we are allying and supporting our students as they are engaging in healing-centered work? Are we understanding about the ebbs and flows that may happen um, in our work? And are we being, um, I'm sorry, can everybody hear me? I'm sorry, I, I went out for a second. Can people still hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, and, and how are we um, responding um, as students continue to lift up both challenges um, and successes, right? And so we will see ups and downs in this process. Um, and then finally, I, I think this is probably the most important point. How are we resisting re-traumatizing of our students, right? Um, and oftentimes this comes in the form of um, not necessarily recognizing how some of the trauma manifests in um, our spaces, uh, but it also means uh, that we are not necessarily appropriately intervening when we see microaggressions or macroaggressions take place in front of us. And so the way to kind of resist some of that re-traumatization -trauma is to be front and center um, when we experience um, any type of harm that is happening within our reach. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's some really simple things we can do um, to put things in place um, initially, um, you know, co-create the healing space. And I, I wanna talk about that. I, you know, Danny said earlier that healing spaces cannot be commanded. And I think oftentimes um, with our energy, we say, okay, you know what? We're gonna go ahead and create a healing centered space. Well, we cannot do that. We don't have the power to do that. Um, we need to acknowledge that healing is something that has to happen internally. Um, with those that we work with in our learning community. So it's really important to actually ask and gain consent um, from those in our learning community uh, to be the architects of a healing space and ask what the needs are. And that will differ vastly from space to space. Um, develop student agency and opportunities. So develop opportunities for, for our students to take on leadership roles, develop opportunities for our students to be a part of that collective healing, um, ensure that our students have a flexible learning environment. And so if there are students who need to take time off, who need to be aware of their own self-care, to be flexible enough in our curricula to make sure that students are able to continue to participate in our programs. Um, again, number four, acknowledge trauma. We've talked about this. Um, engage in mindfulness practices. And so the exercise at the beginning of this webinar to, to have us just sit back for a minute and just reflect and think is a great opportunity to get our students in that same space as we engage in learning practices. Um, ensure that we are creating spaces that where students feel comfortable, um, that this has become a lot um, easier uh, since the pandemic where we're giving people a lot more physical space. But for students um, who are expressing uh, discomfort, just ensuring that we're acknowledging that and giving those students uh, the space they need. I, somebody in the chat said just, you know, having students walk out, maybe that is a policy um, or a, a community standard that we established in the beginning that it is okay for students to walk out so long as dot, dot, dot. Um, again, re-examining uh, school policies with your um, learning team and then focus on the strengths of the individual. Uh, next slide, please. 
program uh, practices for program and staff, uh, be aware of your own healing needs. And, and I think that's why the exercise we did at the beginning was so incredibly important. It really is important for us to acknowledge our limits, acknowledge our, fati uh, our, our fatigue, our exhaustion, our exasperation. I saw somebody who was like, I, I just want to go to Canada. Like, I think it's really important that we talk about that, um, that we acknowledge that, and that we understand that we too are often times in need of healing. Um, it, it, you know, it's difficult to promote healing with our learning community if we're not promoting it within ourselves. Um, teach and model emotional literacy and regulation. It gets increasingly difficult as the world continues to be more and more outrageous, but I do think it's important for us uh, to obviously model that behavior, but also teach that behavior and gently correct the behavior when we see behavior that is inconsistent with our kind of co-created norms, right? So as students are, you know, reacting in the way in which trauma ties and healing students can tend to react, that the nudges that we're given are, are gentle and constructive um, and are encouraging that uh, emotional regulation and boundaries. Um, establish program-wide and regular check-in routines um, as so students can verify and acknowledge and understand that they are cared for, that there are folks who are wanting to check in with them. And then make sure students and staff are aware of resources and support. And that really is something um, that I think ensuring that we have behavioral health resources, physical health resources, um, resources in terms of legal resources and supports, um, supports with uh, financial resources, having those supports available and having um, folks on staff that can quickly provide those resources to students are a way that we can create a healing centered space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then practices in the morning, uh, in the moment, again, be aware of the signs and symptoms of distress. Uh, we talked about them earlier. Uh, you know, students kind of overreacting, underreacting, uh, ups and downs, not present, present. Um, acknowledge that uh, that events, um, acknowledge events, class content, and issues that may be triggering. You know, literally at this point, every day um, when we're watching the news, there is some sort of traumatic event that may trigger any individual when they're in the classroom space. It, being able to acknowledge that publicly with your students in your learning spaces is extremely important to normalizing and level setting folks having reactions. Um, interrupt microaggressions. Um, if we are seeing things that are and macroaggressions, if we're hearing language, if we're hearing um, or seeing um, events that are harmful to our students that we're, we're calling it out and we're correcting it. And we are reminding folks of our community standards, our co-created community standards. Um, provide choice and again, and flexibility, and then reframe behavior. So if we are seeing those trauma responses, um, talking about the response and re reframing it as something that needs to be um, a healing centered response. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to pause there and just ask if there are any questions. And I'm sorry, I, I, I know there was a lot of uh, things that came through the chat. Um, there were there was there was some really good conversation in the chat and you can take a look at it. Um, we kind of answered people's questions as we went. So Stacy, you can take a look and then chat any responses that you see as we move into the next step. Um, I want to say thank you to Stacy for guiding us through both the foundations and then moving into the practices. And that's what we're gonna do right now because we think it's the most impactful for our time together is actually practice together. So we have put together four very short scenarios for you. And in this activity, you're going to choose one of these scenarios with your group. You'll be in a group of four people. Um, take a minute just to introduce yourself because we are coming from all over the country and then very quickly choose which scenario you're going to do. If one of you feels particularly drawn to one scenario, maybe you're working through it right now, 
um, please suggest that to your group and trust that your group will go along with you and work through that scenario. Now, Ebony, if you can go to the next slide, and yes, you will absolutely get a copy of the slides. Um, and um, Stacey, there's some great questions in the chat for you as well, I see. So um, as you read your scenario, you're going to um, answer these three questions on your screen. So take a minute just to read those three questions. It should sound familiar based on the practices that Stacy just gave to you. So those are the questions you're gonna talk about with your group. Now there's no note taking, there's no formal report out here. So just spend the time talking to your group about number one, the practices that can be in place already to make this a healing opportunity. Number two, what can educators and program support do in this scenario? And number three, what would actually responding with a healing centered space do for this um, scenario? I'm putting the handout link into the chat right now. So take a minute to open that up, make sure it's open. And we're going to go into our breakout rooms for 15 minutes. If you have any questions, please let us know. You can raise your hand or you can put them into the chat. Um, we will call you back in 15 minutes. I think Ebony will set a timer for that. Um, and if you want a reminder of the strategies and practices Stacy just walked us through, you're just gonna scroll down to page two of that handout as you talk but feel free to just have a conversation with your group members. Um, Ebony, I think we're ready to go into groups now. You don't need to take any notes unless you want to. It's just, it's just a chat. Thanks. All right, welcome back everybody. We see you're coming back with some smile. I see some smiles coming back from your discussion mm -hmm. carryover. Maybe it's because you were in the middle of the sentence when you got booted out, but either way, we're happy you're smiling. Um, so in a minute, we're gonna do a reflection, um, but for the moment, um, I just wanna turn it back to Stacy to answer an important question someone asked in the chat. So I wanted to revisit a question that Marianne had asked around um, whether or not I was suggesting that we use um, uh, healing centered approaches over trauma informed approaches. And I wanted to clarify that both are kind of interdependent. And so it, it, we have to have trauma informed um, practices in order to understand and relate to our students in our learning community. However, the approach to how we address our knowledge and information around trauma both it needs to be healing centered and culturally rooted. And so I would say that healing centered approaches are actually the approach and the tactic and the strategy used to address your knowledge around um, your trauma informed practices. And I hope that makes sense. Thank you so much, Stacey. That does make sense. Um, so now in our remaining four minutes, we want to first acknowledge that it looks like you had really productive conversations in talking about your scenarios. Um, and we're gonna give you a minute to figure out what you're taking away from today's session. So take a look at the three questions on your screen and we'll have um, 60 seconds of silence for you to think about them. Um, and then we'll ask you to share the answers to one of these in the chat. So take a minute just to think something that resonated with you that was new, something you heard today that confirmed something you already knew, and something you can put into action right away. You can jot something down if you want, but we're just taking a moment to give you time to answer this.
And now we'll move into sharing in the chat. So we want, we'd like each person to share their answer to one of these questions, something that resonated, something that confirmed what you knew. This is great, thank you. So thanks, Zoe says, give students a sense of control. Emma, the importance of building safe spaces for our students and addressing their concerns. For Kate, the shift from trauma-informed to healing-centered was new, <clears throat> new or important. For Lauren, healing spaces can't be commanded and should be co-created. I'm glad that resonated, Lauren. Um, Melanie, I'd like you like the countdown. Um, Lisa, I forget to take care of myself too. PTSD and complex or continuous PTSD and listen more. Beautiful. Lorraine, I'm glad that resonated with you that you can't command the healing space. These are amazing. I'm sharing this chat. We're gonna share these takeaways with you. Um, I have three slides underneath here that are all, it's all room to share your takeaways. So I'm gonna share the chat and import it into the slides and then send that out to you so that you can see what everybody is sharing here. Stacey, anything you're seeing that you wanna comment on here? Well, so I'm looking at Geraldine um, acknowledging that healing can take a long time um, and self-care is really, really important. Um, I, again, somebody lifting up that you cannot command a safe space. I think that's also important. Uh, absolutely ensuring that folks are co-architects of the design of the healing space is really important. Um, so thank you, Arena. Um, again, Sarah, making sure that instructor and staff well-being is also centered is really important, an important piece of this. Um, yeah. Um, somebody like Elizabeth, I'm glad you like the icebreaker. That's great. Um, yes, uh, Deborah. so below you will have a, a resources to uh, kind of dive deeper. Um, Speaking of that, yes. Um, actually, Ebony just moved us to this slide, which I'm gonna share a link for everyone in the chat. This is the resource list that we talked about. Ebony just shared it. Um, and that is where we've curated this list kind of specifically for adult ed. It, it does talk about, um, there's a few sections here, the shift from trauma-informed to healing-centered. If you want additional resources, those are from Stacy. Um, practitioner self-care and secondary trauma. There's two great resources there. Specific to adult education in the workforce, um, there's five resources there. And then what, what you'll see below at the bottom section is practical tips. Um, so we've compiled this for you. Um, Lisa, great question and also a perfect segue into our last slide with Jay. Um, Ebony, if you wanna to go to the last slide, the thank you slide, and I'll turn it over to Jay to close us out. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming. I mean, I think it's been amazing to see the chat and see the connections that people have made. So I hope that you've learned something and also felt really engaged. This is our contact information. If you want to follow up, if you're interested in WeLearn, please reach out to me at welearnwomen at gmail.com. We're looking, always looking for people to support our work. And you can also reach out to Danny, uh, Stacy, and Ebony if you have any other additional questions. We also will be um, having a short survey after you log out. So if you could complete that just to let us know what was useful to you and also to share any additional um, webinar ideas you have, um, that'd be wonderful too. So thank you so much for coming.